Good evening, everyone, on the Craft Beer Collective. My name is Lachlan McLean from Beer Cartel. Uh, tonight, I have a very special guest with me, Richard Watkins of Ben Spoke, owner, co-founder, founder, head brewer, mastermind of great beers. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks very much for having me on the show. Um, come in from the nation's capital. Uh, we managed to hook him in to come do a bit of a tasting. A uh, couple of beers we've got, but mainly for the Cluster 8. Um, coming out, fingers crossed when we put this out for this video for the release. Um, what's Cluster 8? It's been out a couple of times now, but what is it? Yeah, I guess when we started Ben Spoke, I've always had a bit of a love of um, making beers with lots of um, different hops. And I think we started our range, when we opened Ben Spoke, it was um, one of the first beers we had on tap was a crank, was a crank shark. It was yep. one of six beers that we had on tap. and. Um, I guess that started the journey. It was we, we were really surprised that it became our most popular beer, and so it was one of the first beers we put in the can. And we sort of then stepped up a few notches into the sprockets and the red nuts. And then with cluster eight, obviously being a double IPA, it's real all about the celebration of hops yeah. and all about keeping that beer super fresh. So only released in sort of really small batches to try and focus people on making sure that they're getting to get some and, yep. and really enjoy that real fresh hop character. I guess I've been to the Braddon Brewery a few times and there's different clusters. Uh, I think I've had cluster 12, cluster 16 as well. Um, what, what's, where's that name come from? Look, cluster being, um, um, you know, a series of sprockets on the back of a bike. You can have, yep. you know, you can have a, a little four, a four sprocket cluster or you can have an eight sprocket cluster. Um, we've sort of decided that you can also have a 12 sprocket cluster yeah, or right. a 16 sprocket cluster, actually a 14 sprocket cluster we've just got a a new barley wine out um, in, yeah, the, in the brew pub with 14%. Um, we've done a 16, cluster 16, which was a high Belgian um, yep. IPA, double IPA. Um, and then we did basically a sex tuplet IPA, cluster 18. So that would have been a yeah, big fat that. sprocket on, yeah, the, delicious. on the back of the bike. But yeah, no. So um, we've got one here with us. So we thought we might do a little bit of a tasting on this while we, uh, we talk about some other stuff, but I'll leave you with the yeah, uh, honors on that one. So very much a double IPA. Yeah, yeah. It's um, you know, you do get that that hot nose straight away. Um, one of the things I like with 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 our IPAs is that we always try and have some malt backbone. Yeah, it's really important to be able to have that malt backbone because then you can do all the hop layers. Whether you're adding yeah, hops absolutely. in the well, the kettle, in the whirlpool, whether in the you know, in the, in the, and then into the dry hopping. It's all about being able to layer those. Hops. So I think straight away when you look at that, it's a lot a uh, lot richer, a lot more that amber hue than you get yeah. from some other double IPAs. And I think that, yeah. that, that is that malt backbone that's uh, that on it. Um, I'm not 100% sure what, what your brewery is in terms of uh, releasing ingredients on that. Do you, do you release or are able to tell what the hops in on this Yeah, beer? look, we use, um, we use a small amount of Karamunic um, as part of our malt backbone. Um, this beer's got Citra, it's got Mosaic, um, it's got some Equinox, some Simcoe, and some Amarillo. Yep. They're the main hops that we've used in this beer. Classic um, West Coast. Yeah, classic West Coast. Yep. Um, I guess in the different sort of stages that you use them to do different flavours, if you're using Simcoe in, on the hot side or Simcoe in the um, cold side, um, they're you know, producing different flavours. Yep. So getting that balance right of when you use the hops is really important. Yeah. So for um, you know the, the Ben Spoke limited releases, I know that you started with Sprocket and then had Red Nut. Um, they've now gone to Core Range. That's right. And yep. this is now part of the Drifter series? That's right, yep. So, you know, like when you're going out for a bike ride, and you, it's nothing like sitting behind someone drifting along. So you might drift out and move to the yep. front and drift back back yep. in and sitting behind. So this is what this beer's all about. It's, um, it's one of those beers that will drift out, um, but it'll always drift back in. Is there plans for this year to have more beers in the Drifter series? Yeah, we're definitely going to try and release some limited um, release range so that we can um, do more different beers and... Um, we like to, you know, think that we've got a lot of different um, options in the, from out of the brew pub that we'd like to get further afield and let more people yeah. enjoy them. So it's really important to have a, you know, have a media. I mean, with this sort of can, you've got to order 64,000 of these, so it's pretty hard to yeah, do, yeah. you know, 40,000 <laughs> litres of, of um, you know, one of these type of beers all the time. So that's why we'll come up with this new format and hopefully get that out. Is there a, um, you know, I talked to a lot of breweries about the, you know, release schedules of limited releases and um, yeah. they're kind of, you know, uh, they, they don't 
generally say, oh, you know, when we feel like it, it's either, you know, on a four weekly, six weekly, eight yeah. weekly schedule. Yeah. Uh, do you have that or is it kind of as things kind of just come to fruition? Yeah, it's sort of a little bit, you know, it's a little bit bent, I suppose. Um, yeah. You know, we don't have it regimented. Um, we like to, you know, we, we, there's a lot of key dates that we like to celebrate. So, you know, we feel yeah. like when we started Defence Folk and when that, you know, birthday comes up every year, we try and release a different yeah. gear. So that's really important to us. Um, yeah. Hopefully we can get something different out again this year. Um, you know, you got to celebrate those milestones as yeah, much absolutely. as you got to celebrate. You know, monthly, uh, monthly, sort month of for month, and month for month. You know, yeah. these uh, interesting times. I, I always say, you know, the core range is kind of what keeps you ticking along, but the limited releases, and I know for us, the more interesting things is what kind of keeps you engaged and makes it fun. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. I mean, it's it's important for for not only for for us as a brewery to make um, different beers for people to try, but yeah. also for us as brewers. Um, yeah, there's no course. no better way to. <laughs> You know, really enjoy um, what we do for a living than to really make different beers and, and, and really push the boundaries a little bit and play with different ingredients. Um, I guess the other thing, I guess, for Ben Spoke, uh, you opened last year, the year before, the Mitchell production facility. Yeah, November 16. November 16, that yep. was. Yep. Um, but you've still got the Braddon Brew Pub. Yep. Uh, and that's your kind of the, the playground, the, all the limited releases. I know when uh, the first time I went there and I think you've just had your three, core, no, two core range, and yep. we went there and I was staggered about how many different beers um, that were on tap there. Um, is that kind of your, your home, your playground of where you kind of play with things and then learn to see what works and then kind of uh, put, in, put it into can? Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, at the moment, every beer that we've put into can has, um, you know, come from the brew pub, so we've been able to see, you know, obviously whether the punters like like yep. the beer, that particular beer, so it's it's good it's good to have a bit of that that feedback and be able to yep. use that to move forward for sure. So while I've got you, um, I heard a rumor, and this might be completely incorrect. Um, it possibly came from one of my colleagues, uh, who he heard a rumor that uh, if you know Peter Braden, it's over two stories. Yep. Um, with the tanks, all those the kettles up top, the six yep. fermenters, the fermenters downstairs. Yep. And he was saying that obviously that's can be a challenge of how you get it from one to the other. Yep. And he mentioned something yep. about the handrail that goes along the staircase yep. that you can put beer through that handrail, or you have done in the past. Is that true? Yeah. Look, it was really funny that like when we were building um, building the brew pub, we were doing a lot of piping for the brewery, and you know Tracy, my partner, who does most of the brewing now in the brew pub, she yep. she does a bit of welding, and we had a good mate of ours who now works for us, Craig. He does a fair bit of welding in the brew pub, and. So we're getting all these pipes together, fittings, and making up all this piping for the brew pub. And, and um, in rocks the bloke to put the handrails in, and he's got exactly the same piping. Right. So I'm standing <laughs> there going, well, he's using the same piping we are. So why can't we set up, you know, a handrail to, to, to go from the top floor to the bottom floor? So when you're in the brew pub, each handrail does go, does start in the brewery at the top and finish in the brewery downstairs. Yep. Um, and in the early days, um, before we actually had some more piping put in, we were using the handrails quite a bit. So and you did I, use it to push yeah, pump beer from... Yeah, and I had to get in there pretty early because as you can imagine, when you're, yeah. when you're pushing beer upstairs <laughs> and it's freezing cold, you get a bit of condensation on the handrail, so yeah. it's a bit slippery, so you know, couldn't really have punters uh, sliding down the stairs on you know, the, well, the slippery handrail. So we, we use it occasionally now when yeah. we try and do three or four things. We don't use them as much as um, probably what we A, like or, or B, want to, um, but... They are set up to be able to transfer um, well, liquids from upstairs to downstairs. Well, they, uh, there you go. That's uh, one of the few rumours uh, that <laughs> are actually true. Yeah. Um, I wasn't 100% sure because I was down there and I was well, kind of looking around and I've been dying to ask. Um, but yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, that's just genius and, you know, way of uh, utilising as much space as you can. Yeah, well, that's right. In the brew pub, you know, space is really yeah. the premium, so you've got to pack everything in and utilise everything you can. Yeah. Um, I guess we've got a couple of beers here um, with us today, but uh, I don't know if many people saw about it, but it was in the media kind of in the last, I think it was maybe a couple of months ago. Um, kind of kind of ties back into your uh, history with uh, Wigan Pen, um, but you did a beer with Chuck Hunt. Um, do you want to kind of have a little elaborate? Yeah, look, it was really funny. I mean, I, I when I was going to uni in Sydney, I went to uni in New South Wales, and while I was going to Sydney, you know, everyone you have to earn a few dollars, so. I was actually um, playing hockey for the university and um, ended up um, getting a job because the hockey team went across to Han Brewing and worked on the packing line there. So I, I was on the packing line there, just, you know, basically we were doing pretty basic jobs, um, 
you know, pulling bottles off that were too tall, pulling the bottles off that weren't pulling up, yeah. splitting all the bottles up after the shift. Yeah. As a student, that was pretty cool. You take all these beer, all this beer yeah. home. So Great. it was pretty hard work actually, because the bottles flying along in their bottling line. Um, but I guess that was when I first met Chuck. Yeah. Um, and then years years later, when when uh, I got sick of living in Sydney and got out of Sydney, went to Canberra and got a job at the Wigan Pen. Um, he was always really passionate about because back then, like in 94, 95, there were only six breweries in Australia. Six small breweries, you know, there was, there was Lord Nelson, um, we had, um, you know, the Harm Brewery was around at that, that point, we had um, Shara's Little Brewery, yep. um, we had Bootleg Brewery, um, we had a brewery in Melbourne called the G-Bung Polo Club. Yep. So there weren't many, many small breweries around, so everyone sort of knew everyone back then. Yeah, um, very, very small. You know, I guess now over 600 breweries, it's hard to get around and, and get to every yeah, brewery and, and sort of know everyone. From yeah, it's popping up all the time, even just for us as retailers, it's a yeah. struggle to stay on top of all the Yeah, I'm sure it is. So so Chuck used to always come through Canberra because he's a mad skier, so he'd always stop in at the Wigan Pen and have a chat and whatever. And You know, I guess over the course of the years, we got to know each other pretty well and we always talked about doing a beer together. And it's funny, it wasn't until I left the Wigan Pen and set up Ben Spoke and uh, I think we were, um, I think actually I was up in Sydney a few, well, about three or four months ago anyway, and um, sort of went around and saw what they, those guys were up to, and he said, well, we've got to do this beer. So we all sort of got it all sorted. One of their, one of their sales guys um, sort of drove it home through their mm. business, yep. their big business, and, and um, yeah, no, it was really good to sit around with Chuck and work, work out what the recipe was going to be and the type of beer it was going to be. And we ended up sit, setting on somewhere sort of halfway between the James Guy Ra- Amber Ale, which is, yep. you know, one of his first beers yeah. that he did, and, and our Red Nut, so... So right. sort of an extra amber ale, I guess yeah. you want to call it. So I guess it, so. for people that don't actually know, um, you know, Chuck Hahn, especially for kind of new people on in the, in the beer scene, yeah. um, I know he is kind of the grandfather and father of well, Australian Well, he's a craft pioneer beer. of beer in Australia. I mean, he but set up the Hahn Brewery back in the day yeah. when there was really, it was really tough going. Um, and, you know, then the sales tax um, came in and which was pretty well killed him. So, you know, he, he pretty well had to go to Tilly's and say, hey, do you guys want to come on board and help us out and whatever? And then... They did, and he got to set up, you know, the, hunt, the, the James Guy brand and put yep. out some, you know, pretty interesting beers. I mean, they don't especially at the time. Yeah, a- absolutely, that's right. Yeah, I think even even to this day, I think James Squire's range is still, I think, for many a gateway um, brand. And without without that range, I don't think a lot of people would actually progress um, to uh, some of the higher end craft beers. So I think you know what Chuck Hahn's done for the industry, you know, we wouldn't be here without him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, on that beer that you've um, you brewed with him, has that been released? Has that gone? Yeah, that's that that's released. It's in on tap farm around town, and um, so basically uh, Ben Spoke had half the kegs to sell, and uh, we just turned the kegs and and uh, yeah, um, Mel Shovel had the other half the kegs. I think they yeah. they sold all theirs a bit quicker than ours. So, <laughs> so they're still floating around. Yeah, it's um, if you haven't had a taste, um, yeah, hook up and uh, certainly on tap at the brew pub for at least another month. Yeah. So if you're in Canberra, drop in and have a taste. Yeah. So I can get a sausage for everyone. Um, I guess, you know, talking about the whole the Chuck Hahn and the history and um, the Wigan Pen, um, I guess we'll go, we'll, you know, flip it completely and um, we'll talk about some of the new stuff that's been happening and, you know, just for one thing, you know, the Hottest 100 and the strength of the, uh, the Canberra beer market. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, the, the Canberra beer market is, and the strength of our craft beer scene is almost unmatched anywhere in Australia. Like, you go to any bottle shop now and almost all got some sort of craft beer range and inevitably it's always uh, Ben Spoke cap and Capital. Um, you're saying that you're uh, great mates with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, which I think is fantastic. I think, you know, for the craft beer scene to survive, you, everyone has to work together. Um, so I asked, I asked Richard, I'm like, you know, we're also going to do a couple other beers after Cluster 8 and I kind of said, you know, pick an old one, pick a new one. Um, and I was surprised at what you picked for your new beer. Um, yeah, so yeah. I mean, you know, there must be something in the water at Canberra because, I mean, you know, we have got, we feel like we've got some, a pretty good beer scene down there. We're punching out different beers. Those guys are doing good things. In fact, I was in their brewery on Saturday, um, just gone having a few beers with a few brewers from uh, from Melbourne and from Newcastle. And I think one of the good new beers out on the market is this little one that they just put out. Um, so, yeah, let's crack this one open and have a little this. taste. So this is, I'll turn the camera if you didn't see that, that is the Capital Hang Loose. Um, if you didn't actually see it, I actually interviewed their owner, uh, Lawrence. Uh, last week um, for the release of this. So it's gone absolutely gangbusters um, for us and I hope you've been able to get it. Um, but I'm always interested, you know, 
you always ask brewers and you know trying to get them to say another beer other than uh, their own breweries is always uh, not tricky but um, always interesting you know what are you liking and you know what's what do you think is going really good at the moment yeah i mean i think we've got to be we really got to just take take a step back and have a look at our beer industry i think you know the fight at the moment isn't isn't between these two it's not between these two no. the, the fight in the market is is between you know the mainstream yep. beer that's out there and we all need to work together we all need to pat each other on the back we all need to celebrate all the beers we're making because if we can sell we can get our our beer into more more people's hands um then we're all going to sell more beers everyone says to me oh but what do you think about your competitors capital and i say well no they're not competitors they sell more beer because we're around and we sell more beer because they're around it's that simple yeah and without without that you know without those breweries sort of working together i think we're really going to struggle to to really take our industry forward yeah the craft beer industry is not big enough to support i guess not infighting but you know uh competition you know it's a healthy competition is always is always welcomed but we've got to work together and you know we've got to build the industry up before you know anyone can kind of take over we've got to kind of have that strength of industry and then you know that'll help everyone yeah look i mean one of the it's a bit the big challenge is once you get the your beer into people's hands they're they're really interested in it and, and they yep. get engaged they love you know love tasting different things i think the challenge is for people to go into a place and actually you know spend their hard-earned cash on something they've never had before and i think that's the challenge for all of us in the industry is to get people tasting different beers different styles you know everyone making noise about beer and about the flavors and about um, anything interesting about beer or what you're doing everyone needs to make a bit of noise because what happens is that noise just resonates through people and when they next in a bottle shop they'll give something else a go and that's really yeah, important absolutely. i think that there's that big jump in consumer attitudes mm. where they go from not willing to spend money on mm. something they haven't had to almost the extreme end that we see now especially in, in retail where they only want to buy new yeah um, and that, that's actually a, a really big jump for, uh, when you actually kind of sit down and think about it where previously you were like oh i've never had that i don't really spend the money and now people just walk in and go ah oh, i only want what's new what's new i want to give it a try um i think that's fantastic as well yeah yeah um on i guess the hang loose itself uh new england ipa yep uh will we ever see a ben spoke hazy ipa any chance oh look i wouldn't say i wouldn't say <laughs> never i mean i'm a big fan of um i'm a big fan of of new england ipa but i'm really a big fan of the hop haze in new england ipa yep and unfortunately I, even though it's, it is the fat at the moment there's a lot of new england ipa out there that um is all about the yeast haze Yep. And for me, the yeast haze isn't the best way to celebrate hops and celebrate what an IPA should be about. And I think we've done a bit of work on trying to develop a cloudy um, IPA based on hop haze. Yep. And that's what we need to just fine tune and get it right, and then we'll give it a go. I mean, Capital being quite clever here because, you know, they haven't relied on the yeast staying in the beer. They've actually added some, you know, some orange to it so there's yep. a bit of pectin in the orange so you're always going to get the, the cloudiness come through from the fruit that you add as well so i think that's that's sort of quite a clever way to do it um and it all tastes tastes pretty good too it's a good yeah thanks Wade. thanks Wade. um but uh yeah I, I think it's really important because it's not a it's not a yeast driven beer it's like no, the, it's the real new england yeah. ipas are all about that hop haze and yep. that massive amount of dry hopping that creates that hop haze and i think we fall into the trap in australia of too much yeast hazing to be honest, once they've been in the can or the bottle for, for, for you know, a short amount of time, that yeast just puts out all these real... I, I personally don't like those flavours. I, I, yep. If I'm drinking an IPA, I want to really drink a beer that's pronounced hop flavours, not pronounced yeast flavours. Yeah, I know like when I travelled America about you know, 18 months ago and over there, like I had, I guess, what you can call actual New England IPAs for the very first time, and I was, I'm really amazed at, I guess what it actually was and you know how australia was kind of looking at some of the ones they had that we had been uh, that we were seeing kind of as a how do we get to the end result opposed to the process to get there and they were just looking at the haze and you know not artificially making the haze but not doing it in the same way that they were and yeah. not getting that same you know that massive amounts of hop um, yeah. aroma and juiciness that kind of comes with it um, but i think we, we're getting there yeah, yeah. Um, and like like anything, there are definitely some good ones out there yeah absolutely. it's not all doom and gloom no. it's just a lot of New England IPAs out there that are really good. Yeah. Um, I guess kind of uh, on, on, you know, these new beers and um, 
everything that's been going on, but it, are you able to tell us anything that's what we can see on the horizon for Benchburg? And oh, look, I mean, I think we'll, um, you know, we, we're really trying pretty hard to get some, some new beers out. I mean, um, we're working on those. We can't really, you know, we, 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 did, a, we did a Belgian um, IPA with some friends um, um, of late. So we had James from Seabird, um, Dave from uh, Mountain yep, Gate, yep. and Lockie from Grainfed come in. Um, last week um, and do a, a collab oh, yeah, here. Photos, yeah, we've got a Bel yeah. Belgian IPA going on um, with a little bit of orange in it. And so we'll give that a bit of a, a bit of a run. That'll be out and around the keep um, probably in the next few weeks. Yep. Hopefully before Easter, that was the sort of timing around that. Yeah. So um, we also, you know, some new guys into the industry um, called um, Jetty Road down in Mornington Peninsula. Yeah. So yeah, met those guys um, at the Ballarat Beer Festival and they're really good guys. So. Um, they came up to Canberra for the Canberra Beer Fest and we did a, a sour IPA with those guys. So that'll be out and about, um, probably more, more so in Canberra, but it'll be around um, not too long. So yeah, there's awesome. a couple of, couple of new keg, keg beers. Um, as I said, we're working hard in our new can format to try yeah, and get yeah. new beers yep. rolling out. So, you know, we're pretty well locked into the packaging now. So we just need to now move forward and just get, get some beer into the cans, which is yeah, the part yeah. I like. Um, um, so yeah, there will be some new stuff out from yeah. us. Um, um, obviously cluster eight coming out pretty soon. That's something special, so we don't want to corrupt what Keep it open, go yeah. with that as well. So uh, one other thing, you know, um, you mentioned you know beer in cans is what you like. Yeah. Um, I, I remember I asked you this question uh, when I was down at the brew pub last year, I think it was, yeah. and it, it was all about the actual physical cans. Um, and uh, you know, I, I always like to ask that because even after you know eighteen months since the, uh, I asked you that question, no one else has taken up can now um why not well it's an interesting fact i mean they look to be honest the, the lids on these are three times more expensive than the, the traditional yep. lid that we've got here you know so um yeah so i mean you, you know you got your traditional lid or you got your 360 lid um basically you know i really love these i really love them for quite a few reasons i, I think basically to me like they're a cup you know like you can you can yep. see the beer first of all then you can get the aroma out of it. You take a sip and then you can swirl it and, and really, you know, get get you know more aroma. Um, I find it I can drink out of them um, quite easily. I don't get the glug glug out of a normal can. Um, you know, I mean, when you're at a barbecue, at a picnic or whatever, you don't really want to be having yeah. to pour your beer in a glass, especially if you're sitting yeah, on a boat out on a. On I think pe people you know? always ask me. So you know, they go, they're coming in looking at cans, and you know, we always advocate for pouring a beer into a glass and they'll be like, oh, you know, I'm going camping, I'm going mm. out. And I'm like, look, Ben Spoke, or I think there's a couple of others that do it, but I'm like, yeah. go for them. Because yeah, look, Ben Spoke wasn't the first place no. to do it. Colonial Brewing yeah. in Australia was the first place to do it. I mean, we made a decision really early on to do cans. I mean, when the building um, where our brew pub is being built, um, was being built, Trace and I came on site. We actually put can lids underneath the reinforcing of the concrete of the building. So when you're in our brew pub and you look up from downstairs, you'll see can lids in the ceiling. And that yeah, was our right. little sign back in 2013, whatever it was, that we were we were going to always do cans. Um, Are you surprised by the uh, the strength and the, the take off of the can? Um, I think I, I I am a little, I guess. I mean, you can't assume anything, but I think the the main thing that to point out there is that in the states, cans were really going through a major a major boom. You know, sort of 2000 and I guess 10 through to 2015. I think can, I'd, I'd like to know the percentages. I couldn't tell you. I, I don't have that inclination on me. But but the cans to bottle ratio now is in the US. But I, I feel like it's really that's that was yeah. sort of my when I went to the states in 2012 and I saw those cans everywhere and every brewery wanted to do cans. I was going yeah all right we're going to do that. Because yeah I know, I know that um, from just my personal point you know um, I've been working craft beer bottle shops for. 16 years and there was always a little bit of cans and even when I started beer cartel there was kind of you know we had a little bit of cans and you know our fridges were still more I think we had one can fridge um, now we don't have any bottles in any of the fridges uh, and bottles are harder and harder to move um, yeah. cans you know it was just so much easier for us to move and that's just from a mm. pure retail point and we don't force anything you just you know like a brewer you just go with the trends yeah um, yeah. I, I, yeah i think for me it's been a surprise but i guess like you said america was kind of there 10 years you know 10 years ago yeah. and uh, i've always said you know australia mm. was 
Australia is kind of following the American market and the American trend and maybe we're 15 years behind, but I feel that that gap is, we're not saying 15 years behind. We're no, we're, we're, closer we're, that's right, exactly. Yeah. You're exactly right there. I think at some point we'll have our own trend. So yep. in some point we will differ from the US. We'll, we'll okay. start our own trend in Australia. So I think, I think that's we're, where it gets we're, getting, we're, we're catching up very quickly. Yep. So uh, I think we're still a little bit behind, but I think that the, the rate that we're catching up, because um, there's still a lot of market increase in you know, craft beer in Australia, um, and in the US it's slowed down a fair bit. Um, so I think we will we'll definitely catch or get very close to the US, and then I think we'll have our own trend. And what that trend yep. is, I, you know, I'd love to know. Because I've, I've started, <laughs> yeah. but I, I, I can't, you know, yeah. even though, I've, well, I think I'm probably Australia's oldest, current oldest working brewer, as we speak at the moment. I don't think you can probably tell time around. I've been <laughs> brewing beer longer than I have in Australia since, you know, 94, 95. Well, I've, you know, that's um, actually a, uh, that's a really good segue because um, when you came in, I kind of asked you, is, you know, what's, what's your current favourite beer? And, and then I also asked him, like, well, also, you know, let's do one that's kind of an old classic or... You know, one of those interesting beers, and I was very excited with the one you pulled out. Yeah, so we, we pulled out this little number here. Um, you know, one of the things you do, you get to do when you're a brewer, is you get invited to go and judge beer overseas, and <laughs> you get to go around the world and taste all yep. these different beers. And I think one of the best trips that, that me and Trace ever did was um, obviously to go to Belgium, and we had some friends that got us into some really interesting breweries over there, and uh, being able to go along to, to see Frank Boone at, at Boone and, yep. and try his... Uh, Try his Gers was um, very special moment. We had a lot of special moments on that trip, and I think the main the main thing you can you sort of get out of a trip like that is you've got to understand the history and what that what that means to, to the beer industry. And I think you know beers beers like this um, that have such a history and such a um, you know a real sort of higher echelon um, quality um, really has driven a lot of people into into beer. Um, and, and Europe, you know, they make, they're, they're way ahead of us in terms of, um, I think, in terms of the amount of beer that, the quality beer that's around in the market. There's still mainstream beer, but it's not 95% of the, the no, beer sold. Like I've always, you know, you know, whenever I do education courses or do Belgian beer master classes or whatnot, I, um, there's a statistic or kind of a fact that I found about Belgian beer. Like, for me, it's my, it's my all-time favourite. Um, and it was that Belgium is the only country in the world that their beer culture is a UNESCO uh, listed for a significance to their cultural history. Uh, not Germany, not America, Belgium. Belgium, yeah. Um, that, that's how important beer and the beer culture is to yeah. the country, and uh, it just shows. And you know, you walk down some of those like Brussels or mm. Bruges or whatever. It's every second store is a beer mm. shop. Um, all mm. their tourism is beer. Um, and then you know, I remember finding myself. Later and then just and I was in this tiny little pub and you know the locals who didn't speak English and uh, were, were all there having their dinner and they weren't having wine they were having beer and it was a it was a big bottle of something of the locals I don't even know what it was um, but it was in the middle of middle of the table and they were just drinking it as a you know as a yeah of wine and for me that yeah. that's fantastic and yeah. that's just for me that's the ultimate dream of Australia where people kind of treat beer as you know you know that accompaniment to food to um, not just a pure drink yeah um, I, I love Belgium. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the other thing we, we should put into perspective is that these beers here, like this type of beer, they get, you know, they get brewed. Um, they yep. use natural natural yeasts that are, that are in the air um, to ferment these type of beers. They then they then get aged for a long yeah, period absolutely. of time. So you're making this beer knowing that you're not going to get paid for 12 months. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard, these are hard styles of beer to make. I mean, I played around with a lot of these when I was at the Wigan Pan. I think it was me, uh, Brad Rogers, um, when he was at the Tour de Bay now at Stone and Wood and Brendan from Feral, we were some yep. of the first people in Australia to do barrel aged beers and you know, if I had the space I'd love to do more. We started a little bit of barrel aging at, at Ben Stoke and hopefully we can we can take that further and do some more interesting beers. So yeah, stay tuned for that. But um, I think just the history and just the complexity that goes into not only the flavour in this beer but the yeah. actual making of this beer is really something we should really savour, you know. Yeah, I'd love to think in a you know a couple hundred years or a hundred years, well after our times, that, that you know Australia is a uh, drinking goozers or you know possibly mm. our own equivalent that hasn't even been founded yet. Um, but you know, you mentioned you know Brendan and um, Brad and all those people, and you know you said that you're probably the oldest uh, continual brewer at the moment. How did you get into beer and brewing? Um, it's funny. Um, I, I made ginger beer when I was a kid at home, and um, and uh, you know started to think about all right. 
what am I going to do with my life? Didn't really know. Went off to Sydney and just, you know, because all my school friends were going to Sydney, so I thought, well, I'll go to Sydney too and get some science degree and then start a home brew. Yep. You know, beer was expensive. Didn't have the money to buy it. <laughs> Started making beer because it was cheaper. Yep. But what that means is it, it, it gets your taste buds going. You know, you, even though I started with, with kit beer and I brewed a lot of beer from kit, it was all about, oh, geez, this is actually like Cooper's or, hey, this yeah, beer's yeah. not too bad. This is a bit darker. And, and so that's how I sort of started getting into the flavours and then lucky enough to sort of wind up, I guess, at the Wigan Pen and bring out a... You know, when I started the Wigan Pen, there was, um, they had uh, three hand pumps and, and basically, you know, the other beers they had on tap were, you know, were your Newcastle Brown, your Cooper's Pale and whatever. So the brewery was really only producing, um, you know, hand pumped beer. But the brewer at the time knew that wasn't going to gonna last. He started making a, um, you know, he made a beer, an Irish Red Ale and yep. just started trying to change things. And then he left and I took over from the 98 and... And the first thing I did was put in two more taps. I didn't want to play with any of his beers. They were all going really well. Yep. But I wanted to do some of my own beers. So I put yeah. in two more taps. And I did a Kolsch. Yeah. Um, and I did a wheat beer. Yeah, cool. And that was the sort of start of going, all right, let's see what people are into. So the Kolsch obviously went really well because it was a lager-like ale. It was yep. quite easy to say to someone, well, how about you give this a go? Because it wasn't too different from a mainstream beer. Um, even though for me, I thought it was a long way from a mainstream yeah, beer. Yeah. So you know, it was interesting to see how people sort of vote. And then I guess over the years we put in more and more taps. We ended up with 16 different beers there. Six, sorry, 16 different taps. We ended up with nearly 500 different beers now at the Wigan Pen. So really had a big grounding in making lots of different yep. beers, um, playing around with different flavours and getting to see what people wanted. Yeah, awesome. And then obviously Ben Spoke started in 2013. 14, yeah. 14. Yep. Um, what's the, why Ben Spoke and, you know, where did that come from? What was the naming and? Oh, look, it's funny. We had, uh, you know, I still remember it pretty clearly, actually. We, we had very little time to register a name. We'd been thinking about it. We'd been tossing names back and forth all the time, you know, for a long period of time. And we were lying in bed one, one morning and Tracy said, well, why don't we call it Ben Spoke? You like making Ben beers and you like riding bikes. So that's sort of what <laughs> stuck, you know. And, yeah. and it's just, you know. That's gotta, a great name. Yeah, you've got to come up with something. So, you know, sort of, I think it sort of fits who we are, which is important. Um, and um, whilst we, we do have a main, you know, we do have a, a, um, a core range of beers, we um, still tend to bend the rules. We do different things with yeah. our beers and trying to put out different beers all the time. So. I th yeah, I think, you know, Ben Spoke beers have always been one of those breweries where I think, you know, quality is always first and foremost that uh, you, you see and you never see. You, know, you, you can open a, a crankshaft here or in Perth or wherever and it always tastes exactly the same. Um, they're always going really, really well. So I think you had, you're doing fantastic in the Hollis 100 that um, happened a couple months ago. Mm. I think you had, how many beers did you have? Four, five? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we had five, five, five in the top yep. 23 or something. It was pretty impressive. Yeah. I was pretty happy. I was pretty nervous actually, funnily enough, that year. I mean, in previous years it was funny because the expectations weren't really there, yep. you know. Um, but I guess once you, you know, after last year when we, we came third at Crankshaft and then we had a, we had a, a um, the Bailey Griffin on the sprocket in the top 30, um, I was thinking, oh, look, there's so many other good beers out there that, that some of our beers are going to just, you know, really move to the back of the 100 or even drop out, to be honest. And and uh, once we got down to the top sort of 30, I'm thinking to myself, all right, this is going to go two <laughs> ways here. We're going to either have one beer in the top top 30 or we might have a few. So luckily we ended up with a few. And, and look, I think, you know, once again, it's really good to see... Um, you know, see our mates at Capital have some yeah, beers in the top five top thirty as well. As well. Yeah, so they had well. yeah, they had five or six in the top hundred as well. So that was I think you know, really good. So that was I think Canberra Punch and you know, per capita way, yeah. I think we had more beers per capita than anywhere else. Yep. So that was really you know, really, really good to see. And I think that's a big vote for Canberra. I think gone are the days where people should think of Canberra as a boring place to come. I think people in Canberra really enjoy flavour. They know what they're yeah. talking about. We have more restaurants per capita than anywhere else in uh, Australia. I love every time I come out of Canberra. And people should come down to Canberra. Yeah, I can't recommend the Brighton Brew Pub um, high, highly enough. Like, I've been there a couple of times. Um, I try to go there every time I'm in Canberra. Um, absolutely love it. It's always a great night um, or day. Uh, whenever you're there, um, it's in a great location as well. So make sure whenever you're in Canberra, go uh, visit Ben Spoke. And also Capital when you're there. Uh, do the tour. Um, but thank you so much for joining me today. Mm. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you in Sydney and taking the time out to come talk to us. It's been absolutely fascinating mm. to listen to you. 
Um, for anyone out there, Cluster 8 uh, is available, so it won't last long. So make sure you grab it as soon as you can. If uh, it's online or in store, make sure you come grab it. Once again, thank you so much for joining me. And thank we'll you. See you and, next week. and just one quick thing, look, support support your local bottle shop. Yep. Like Lockie and Richard and the others are doing such a great job with this place, and and I think we need these people around supporting our beer industry to grow it. And without you know beer cartel and the, and, and the others that are doing this type of work, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be able to sit here and talk to you about beer. So you know, big big thumbs up to, to these guys, and just you guys keep doing what you're we doing. Will. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good night. Cheers.